see so many familiar faces. Um, these days, you know, I don't get to see as much people on a regular basis, and so I really look forward to today to the social aspect as much as anything else. Um, today is the theme of our uh, meeting today, of course, is Eastern Technology for Teaching Initiative. And there are a number of our sessions and things that address technology as well as a wide variety of other concerns about the Central Office Initiative. Uh, again, I want to thank everyone for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here. I know it's contractual, so I'll let you And uh, again, I want to say that I, I'm particularly looking forward to this debate of that because the topic of the keynote speech AI is something that I've been looking at for almost 10 years. And as you know, last year it finally exposed us to the public consciousness. And as a consequence of our work here at uh, Middlesex, many of you may not know, we were really early adopters in looking at it. Um, our keynote speaker today, Charles Fidel, is globally known, um, and he was here at Peace Army Campus, I think about four or five years ago, just before COVID. So we were really um, ahead of the curve, and we're still ahead of the curve today, and we're unstable. Um, so again, I look forward to, to seeing you throughout the day, and I hope you have a wonderful time. And without further ado, it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce our, our Vice President for Australian Affairs and Public, Thank you, Peter, so much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Great to see you all. Um, for those of you, I really want to thank Peter again. This is not an easy thing to do, who organizes the Mental Health Professional Day. So I want to make sure that we give Peter an extra round of applause. Thank you. 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 Could you wait, stand up, tell us who you are, because you've also done a lot for me today as well. So thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. I have a shout out to everyone as well. So more shout outs for the advisory board at lunch. Awesome, thank you. Um, I also want to give a special thank you to our student musicians today. Uh, I, I want to, I'm going to call for you, could you just wait so you know who you are? Navar Williams, the guitarist of Navar Williams. <laughs> Neil Finnegan. Thank you very much. Jonathan Pantalone. Phil Chow. And our topic this morning is James Yu. Uh, for mentoring them and for giving us the pleasure of listening to their music this morning. So again, welcome. And Peter knows that today is going to be a pivotal conversation on the future of education in the age of artificial intelligence. Charles Fidel embodies. I want to share a little bit about our speaker because I one of the things I was talking to Peter about last semester was the fact that we already started to have concerns building up from faculty around the fear of AI, generative AI, and, and how that was going to affect education. And I know we've been always ahead of the curve with looking at how to implement solid pedagogy, pedagogical techniques to, to make to take advantage of this. And I'm very thankful to Peter for bringing Charles to us today. And actually, think an extra thankful to Charles, who's, who's scheduled a second day. We're going to have time with Charles on, in October, and I'm thankful that we're able to, he's able to make it today. Charles Fidel embodies the spirit of innovation and foresight. As the founder and chairman of the Center for Curriculum and Design in Boston, Charles has dedicated his career to answering the critical question, what should students learn for the 21st century? His mission is to make education more relevant, is particularly crucial in an era where artificial intelligence reshapes every aspect of our lives. Charles brings to us a wealth of experience, not just from the realm of education, but from a 25-year illustrious career in high tech, witnessing firsthand the disruptive effects of exponential change. His journey has taken him from the global education lead at Cisco Systems to the founder of Neurodyne, a startup and neural network and artificial intelligence. His insights are enriched by his roles across various prestigious platforms 
including as a visiting practitioner at Harvard's Graduate School of Education, where he explored the confluence of human learning and machine learning. As an author, Charles has contributed profoundly to our understanding of education's future amidst the rise of AI. His seminal works, including Education for the Age of AI and Artificial Intelligence in Education, provide a blueprint for integrating knowledge, skill, and character in curriculum design, preparing leaders not just to succeed, but to thrive in this new era. His consultancy spans continents, influencing education policy, curriculum design and teacher training, showcasing his commitment to fostering global education uh, and global education for innovation. His keynote today promises to be a beacon for all of us committed to preparing our students for a future where they not only adapt to change, they're the ones leading the change. So good morning, everyone. Please welcome Charles Kinney. jobs because there's a lot of hype out there that we're going to talk about the impact on education and at every step of the way you'll see I'll give you a chance to ask questions okay so yes um, that's what we've been doing developing vision ahead of the fact uh, we work with a number of institutions particularly the OECD the International Baccalaureate and others and uh, one thing I do want to mention, yes, so yes, I started Neurodyne AI when we could only compute three layers of neurons, so that died kind of quickly. Uh, that was back when most of you were not born, and uh, uh, at the time, Margaret Minsky was the big keys out there, and basically he built neural networks. He didn't have to, really, because he took another 100 million fold improvement in computing power to get to where we are. 100 million fold took, you know, 30 plus years. That's why I was working at the time at analog devices and other chip companies. Hi, Tracy. So, um, yeah, I used to live in Chelmsford and all that. So, it's been a long journey to get where we are. And ah, here's the agenda now. We're at the second point. Anyone have questions about who we are at the center? Time to ask. We work with a number of jurisdictions around the world. And yes, the goal is to reshape education for native AI. Okay. Now to talk about hypothesis reality. The good news about having been around the block a few times is that I've seen the sort of excitement and the plateauing of the excitement happen several times in my career. Okay, so we had, for those of you who are old enough, you can hear back in the history, you know that Marvin Minsky was promising that in one summer, a graduate student would be able to solve machine learning. Oh, yeah. Perhaps with the wrong graduate student. <laughs> but here we are, still waiting. So for anyone who says, hey, we've solved it, uh, there's a lot of complexity to doing these things. And uh, it's no surprise that our brains are so complicated. So what I want to do is focus on the reality of things. Um, 
all the talk about AGI and super intelligence that's really interesting and fascinating philosophically mm -hmm. even, but not really relevant for any time soon. And I'll show you why. <coughs> so the point here is that we need to pay attention to this uh, capable phase. The capable phase where we went from the narrow AI of the 2010s, where it was about you know, solving narrow problems, to the capacity of, machine, of uh, language models to be much broader and therefore transfer a lot better. So the early, pro the early machine learning models were already able to do amazing things. Solve bounded problems. So in engineering, we call them bounded problems, right? They have a very finite board or situation, and they have very clear rules. Even if the computational space is enormous, like in Stratego, 10 to the 535 power, it doesn't really matter. It's still a bounded problem. And so if you're going to be folding proteins or, or uh, sorting through chemicals or things of that nature, it's perfectly possible to do that even last decade. And it was very exciting, of course. But these are bounded problems. And the problem, of course, is that these systems need an enormous amount of data. And we couldn't do that 30 years ago. There were just no, no data sets of that magnitude, right? I mean, after go alone, it would take an enormous amount of time to acquire the knowledge to do this. And they're brittle. These systems are very brittle. For them, the things are both faces. Of course, as humans, we all know that the face on the left is the right face. <laughs> uh, that is a facsimile on the right. And it can confuse a robin and a cheetah with just a few pixels of difference. It can confuse a stop sign with a speed limit sign with just a few pixels of difference. They're very brittle. And they don't transfer very well because they're trained on one sort of thing. They will recognize this one sort of thing everywhere. So um, I have dogs, and therefore I'm seeing dogs everywhere, right? Is there anything else but dogs? Not for me. And I see only dogs. Dog, 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 dog. And I see dogs. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> and I see dogs, even in the supermarket, because I've been so weak, so overtrained to see dogs. I don't see dogs everywhere. Whoa. <laughs> whoa, whoa. Um, yeah, so that's that's one of the what are called features of these systems. They're trained on one thing, and they'll find this thing when appropriate, and sometimes, yes, they find it too much, let's say. So the problem with these systems, of course, is they also have to be really clearly formatted. It doesn't, it does, they don't do very well when uh, the data is a mess. You have to format the data first. They're also opaque. You don't know exactly how they're converging uh, when you have 5,000 layers. And I said, tangents. <laughs> So yes, we don't know how they converge, and it's a problem. Imagine that so you have a student and they're writing an essay, and the system says, ah, you get a C. The first thing the student say, come to you and say, why not an A? I deserve an A. Um, you have no idea why. Because the system doesn't tell you why it decided. So it just compared to a billion other essays, and it decided you know what, this is an average, statistically average essay. I can tell that. But go explain that to the student that it's an average essay. Right. Um, yeah. 
So, the, so this is really what has changed, right? Um, with, with language model, because they trade on an enormous corpus of information, right? Absolutely enormous, basically all of Wikipedia, pretty much everything you can scour on the internet, on the visible internet. You can have a much, much, much bigger boundary. Now it's not trained only on Turkey, only, only on Go, or only on whatever. It's trained on every language thing it can find. And so as a result, it's much more, much broader in terms of for, for the expertise, and therefore can transfer a lot better because it's not so narrowly bounded. The second thing that's really important about these, um, uh, these uh, language models is that uh, you can connect them to other data types. So you can have a math database out of Mathematica or MATLAB, and you can connect it to your LLM of choice, and supposedly it will function better than you can run from separate. Not so clear so far that it's working very well. Whatever, that's at least one of the possibilities that emerge. So that's, that's really, really interesting from an engineering perspective, and I'm going to get back to this in a moment. Uh, but the problem is the fundamental limitations remain. They're still the same type of algorithm, the neural networks algorithms, and they have the limitations of neural networks taken alone. And that's why you can keep seeing hallucination. Actually, the very Output of what the system gives you is a hallucination, is an infatuation. It's just that sometimes they're correct and sometimes they're not so correct, but that's how they actually function. They function by giving you whatever comes to their quote unquote mind. So it's a feature, not a bug, as we say in software, but you know, um, you gotta figure out how to sort it. Of course, it's very data hungry, it's very opaque, and when we talk about reasoning, at least, that's one problem which I find a lot in, uh, in AI, is that it, they use psychology words. And because we're so good at anthropomorphizing technology, we read too much in these words. So when they, they talk about reasoning, when they talk about emergence, we read a lot more than we, sh we should be reading. And that's one of the problems of, of uh, being not imprecise with language. So, as I was saying earlier, we've seen a 100 million fold improvement in 35 years, and so, um, yeah, that's where we are now, and that's why we can compute more than three layers. Um, and it was, it's basically brute force. These algorithms were available even in the 70s. It's just an enormous amount of brute force that has been applied, and they, as you said, forced on the work. Um, What's going to be interesting, of course, is to see what happens as Moore's law plateau. Now it's going to force the software engineers to do a much, much, much better job. Um, well, remember, for instance, that you know, I don't know, for most of you, be aware that um, the Apollo 11 mission worked on 64K of memory. 64K. Uh, it's one pixel nowadays on your iPad, iPad or equivalent. So, uh, it's, you know, the, the art of refining software has been lost because of brute force. And if Moore's law starts uh, plateauing, which I really hope it does, it's going to force software to become better again. So, anyway, point is, um, we've seen a hype cycle. You're familiar with Dr. hype cycle. There's always, in any new technology, this hype situation then goes back down and the rework occurs over the following 30 years, and then eventually you see something we are at the peak of the hype cycle for AGI, I mean, generalized intelligence, and Gen AI as a, as a meme in general. So I need to read this, and why generalized intelligence is a hype, or the time being. Please read. So even when the chief hyper, Sam Altman, says so, even he admits uh, that the baby is not perfect. So this is what happens, I've found with a lot of uh, scientists, particularly in this case, right? So when Marvin Minsky killed neural networks for a while, people working on it, like 
you know, get into the others, went underground. We had to call it deep learning because we thought the neural network would never get funding again. <laughs> and so they went underground for a while, and all of a sudden it's their moment of glory. So they're delighted, but they don't want to hear that their baby isn't perfect, that there's just yet another plateau. So yes, it's doing wonderful things. Now it's not just crawling, it's walking. Fabulous, but it's still not running the marathon. And they're, they're desperate to see that thing happen. So there's a lot of uh, human intensity applied to just technology, right? The human psychology that goes in. And that's why you see all these claims of, oh yeah, yeah, we're gonna get there, we're gonna get there. Every new generation talks about, ah, we finally cracked it. We have the super intelligence. Right now, the only way you can see it is in the movie Her. Yeah. So, that, because a lot, a lot of times people confuse what's possible with what's probable, right? So, you know, it's possible that eventually, blah, 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 what's the likelihood? This is where you gotta apply your probabilistic mind and say, okay, really, it's unlikely for the time being. It's gonna require more, more jumps in capability. But what gets lost in all these debates is that we are in a very, very, very important phase. So we, we're moving really from the science phase to the engineering phase. And this is where we can do a lot of good things. We can tie these systems together. We can do all sorts of cool things. And we don't have to wait for AGI to occur to do these things. We have an enormous capability in our hands now. It's going to be fun using it. So, okay, how are we going to do so? But this is, this is really something I want to stress. We have enormous capabilities in our hand in this capable phase. We don't need to wait. Yeah. Of course, as humans, what's happening is that we're always behind a change, right? So public policy being the slowest to adapt. And you know we have to move a lot faster to adapt to where the ball will be rather than where it is. And that requires people like yourself and prompted by Peter to stay ahead of the curve. <laughs> okay. I'll pause. Questions so far? Psychology teaches us that it takes about eight to ten seconds for people to even formulate a question, so I'll give you the required eight to ten seconds. <laughs> Go there. Thank you. You know what? My, my presentation was today. I had the same question, so I'm missing something in these slides. So, a generalized intelligence means an intelligence that can do what a, a single human can do. Okay. So, just general enough to be thrown into whatever situation and perform as a reasonable being. Apart from that, these things are very, very narrow. Sure, they can write essays and whatever, but it's very narrow. Thank you. And super intelligence is really being able to act like all humans combined, which is monstrously capable. So we're nowhere near all of this, rest assured. Yes? So you mentioned the hype cycle and yeah. the trough of disillusionment, I think. Yeah. So do you see that happening with the utility that has sort of been climatically uh, created, say, as quickly and put back up in, uh, well, in the current uses? If you it's, it's broad, but even in that context, you can say, okay, great, you can generate essays, but they're whole hum essays. They're center of the distribution essay. This is a statistical engine, and it's going to give you an average essay. So if all you care about is an average essay, fine, but you should be as professors asking for better than an average essay. That still might be a big market. <laughs> Absolutely, this is as big a market as people writing the essay for you, right? I mean, the stuff has existed. So, here, let me take a quick parenthesis here. One of the problems we're all facing, and this is one of the consequences of having tools like this, is that um, we are lazy by good evolutionary design. Let me explain. Our brains consume 20% of the energy of our body for 5% of the body mass. Okay, so they're a very, it's a very uh, high power consumption organ. So the tendency is for evolution to survive 
is to minimize scattering. And if we do so, is to keep ourselves on autopilot as quickly as we can. Right? That's why we make these snap judgments about people, etc., etc., etc. We so if there's a tool that's gonna help me get my fake A quickly, I'm gonna get my fake A quickly. Uh, it's lazy by good evolutionary design. So the, the, the challenge for all of you, all of us, uh, is to figure out how to really force the student beyond their, this uh, simple comfort zone by being more clever about how we ask for their tasks. And actually, there's one thing that uh, AI is doing really well. It's shining the spotlight on how inadequate our assessments were. So, more on that later. Yes, okay. So I'll explain what I was saying earlier about emergence and, and the definition, right? So the improper use of language by the AI community, uh, when they say emergence in physics or engineering, they'll simply call it a threshold. It passes a threshold, right? But they call it emergence. So it sounds like, you know, the, the beast coming out of the swamp and becoming intelligent. So they want to say, hey, it passed the threshold. It was useless before. At a certain size of vocabulary, etc., it passes a threshold. And guess what? It's starting to saturate already. Look at GPT 4 versus 5. GPT 5 is going sideways, meaning into multimodality and all sorts of other things. It's not trying to keep on adding, adding, adding more, more profile. No, for, 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 for. Uh, And so that's one example of poor use that gets uh, mistaken in layering circles as, oh my god, it's already doing these unnatural things. Um, what was the other example I gave earlier? Besides the emergence. Dreaming, thank you, someone was paying attention. <laughs> and has a good memory. Uh, so reasoning, same deep. Um, it, I, I find it so, Part of the work I do with the OECD is really to see some of the research and how they're approaching it. And for me, approaching this research with the angle of intelligence is absolutely the wrong way of doing it. A, because our own definitions of intelligence are so incomplete, so messy. You have 25 different you know, terms we give to intelligence, you know, fluid and this and that, and conceptual, blah, 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 blah. No one having a really good ontology for it. And so when you start comparing AI to an incomplete human ontology, it's a mess. It's a lot better to look at tasks. Can it do this or can it not? And so yes, you are right. It's a good old scientific practice or engineering practice to reduce the number of parameters to one, look at one parameter at a time and see if you can do it or not. Other questions? Yeah. Can you speak to the carbon that AI will have on this uh, it already has a high carbon footprint, but if you want to be angry at carbon footprint, go after cryptocurrencies first. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, at least this is useful. <laughs> uh, and I'm with you, of course, but the good news is that um, there are plenty of much faster, much cheaper, much smaller models coming out. Plenty. I mean, half a dozen different already. And so that's going to drastically drop the consumption needed. On the other hand, we are going to all be using a lot more of it. So that's going to counterbalance the, the uh, our consumption of a given model to the scale it's going to get with a lot of people. Look, uh, in general, uh, this is completely aside from anything to do with AI. If you want to talk about global warming, there is no escape besides fusion and fission. And I'd be happy to debate you about that. And everything else is not sufficient to get us out of the problem. And so, anyway. It's always a parenthesis, but thank you. Okay, jobs. Jobs, what? 
Jobs. Jobs. Okay, so you, you're going to see a lot of data like this from the IMF, from others saying, oh my God, some jobs are exposed. It's true that they are exposed. It doesn't necessarily mean that they disappear, right? So, for example, the bookkeeper job was exposed because of spreadsheets. What happened? Well, they used the spreadsheet and now they do simulation. The same happened here. So, we adapt, we increase our skill set. And we use the technology. So again, we're not talking about AGI removing all the jobs. The other thing that happens is uh, we tend to minimize what we don't understand. That's the dunning Kruger effect. Right? So if you ask me, can can I do I don't know, one of you and say, of course I can. Well, so so easy, you just go and prepare a lesson and deliver it the next day. Not so hard about that. But then I realized, oh my God, once you actually start knowing what the person actually has to do, they are doing nothing. <laughs> so that's Dunning Kruger, the Dunning Kruger effect. So you were asked earlier, a uh, little bit there, my lecture about psychology. That's another situation here developing where um, economists that are looking at the effect of, of AI on jobs are very, very superficial. They don't do what we call cognitive task analysis to know exactly what it is that we do in our daily jobs. If I was to ask you, for example, do you use critical thinking in your day? Everyone would say yes, obviously. But how much of it? In what circumstances? Not really yet, right? So that's the sort of uh, uh, specificity, uh, level of graininess that you need to know to know exactly what's going to be changing. And so people who say, oh my god, you can pass uh, a legal exam, or oh my god, you can do a legal task, and extrapolate to, oh my god, all lawyers are replaced. That's a huge extrapolation. Huge, huge, huge extrapolation. So don't be steep. The other thing, the other thing that happens is that uh, we are absolutely terrible at imagining the new jobs that emerge. So this is from the World Economic Forum, uh, looking at the past 10 years ago, ten, so from 2007 to 2017, and realizing we had missed out on all of these jobs. I mean, I'm still puzzled per personally that the uh, influencer is a job. <laughs> but it is. Uh, and so here we go. So, lack of imagination. So, economists are futurists, futurists no, don't, are not, you know, don't have a crystal ball, etc. And then, we discount the fact that people adapt, right? I mean, people are already adapting in the workforce. Whether it's employee or employers, everyone is just looking at the same thing. How can I quickly, quickly update my capabilities and, and learn? So, for all these reasons, there's no such thing as AGI, as there's no such thing as all the jobs, and you are still needed. Being mass produced. <laughs> I made your day. <laughs> All right, let's stop here. Let's stop on a high. Okay, questions? Questions? I have seen that some educators have already um, implemented AI in their education methods, like the Western students, for example, to use uh, language models in their research or their papers. How do you think that um, in the future, can educators implement AI um, to improve uh, education? Uh, well, that's the next section I'm going to talk about. Mm. So I'll ask for your patience. Yes. Other questions about jobs? Yeah, all the way there. <laughs> So, so Moore's Law, um, sorry, for, for those of us who live in semiconductors, it seems, you know, everybody knows Moore's Law, but it's a very wise uh, task here. So Moore's Law, for the Moore of Intel, back in the, heck, what, 60s perhaps, formulated a law that the semiconductor density was going to double every 18 months. 
In other words, it's an exponential. Every 18 months, it doubles. But at first, it doubles from a small base, so about, about two, four bits of seed, maybe two. But then you go a million, two million, four million, eight million, twelve. That's exploding on you. So that's what happened with Moore's law. Semiconductor density has gotten better and better. And so single year, the 100 million fold during my, my career in microchips. And that 100 million fold makes an enormous difference, right? So we were able to brute force a lot of things thanks to just processor, microprocessor capacity becoming much better. And different types of processors, so different architectures. Yeah. In particular, the graphics processors that NVIDIA had turned out by sheer luck for them uh, and their shareholders, which I'm not. <laughs> Just missing by line. Um, I could have bought that third, not asking why I didn't. Um, because of, you know, these architectures suited for multiplying two minute functions a lot better. By the way, visual signal processors did that too, but anyway. That was were better because they were computing the ABCs of the power. That was quite enough. So um, that's what allowed this enormous progress. Now, why Moore's law has is declining to nothing because there's only so much you can shrink the transistor before having little noise between atoms. It's gotten so small now we're reaching two nanometers, one nanometer. Really, we're getting more. Um, it's been a while already that we've gotten a lot more from parallelizing cores, so we have 64 cores on a single chip. So we've gotten parallel, parallel, and we are now going 3D and stacking chips one top on top of the other to allow to bring out as much as we can out of these uh, topologies and uh, out of these geometries. But it's reaching an end, and that's why I'm saying it's good news for the software people because now they're going to have to. You know, not be sloppy anymore and give you Adobe for 500 gigabytes that you download on your, your phone or something. Give them a break. It could be a lot denser than that, right? Uh, Absolutely. It becomes so sloppy. So now it's going to force all, all the software designers to go back to when you had to, I mean, in the old days, before all of you were born, you had to code this on stacks of cards. Stacks of cards. And of course, you did not want to make a mistake because if you did, you had to restart the whole process all over again. And of course, that thing became easier. You know, that's fine. So we're going to go back to less sloppy times. Thank you. Well, just FYI, my father used to work at IBM. I think they get their stack cards for book once. <laughs> I still have one, I saved lots. So these uh, generators can actually write software. What do you think about the software coming out of these artificial things? Okay, so um, I have a personal opinion. I'm going to ask Devin to chime in. But my personal opinion is it makes you write the software a lot faster, but now you're going to spend more time debugging it because you have no idea how it's working. So Devin, you say you're more likely. Yeah, like. It, um, I would say that it's getting better because I think they're starting to use more curated data sets for training a lot of these software models. Um, one of the tools that's available right now is called Prime, P-H-I-N-D. And it turns out their, their model, even though it's a lot smaller than OpenAI's ChatGPT model, it's a lot better at giving software development advice. And it's a lot better at producing code that's less buggy. So I, I think there's a lot of optimization that we still go on, not necessarily even with the models, but just the, the data that we are feeding into these models to get better output. So I agree that with you, Charles, that it's still not great. You have to spend a lot of time debugging. And in some cases, it's not even worth generating code from AI. But I think it's getting, there, there's still a lot of refinement that needs to be Actually, you remind me, Devin, that there's also, um, I saw a, a paper on a system that force, that writes the instruction, the, the justification for every code line right after it. Right. So you can literally see what it's done. Right. Right, so, and I don't know too many humans who do that, you know what I'm saying? 
Um, you will probably offer a survey, don't help me, that level of precision. So, you know, mixed bag is going to get there. So, another thing that Devin was saying that's really important for us is the aspect of customizing the data set. That's huge. That's one of the enormous uh, improvements we're going to see in healthcare, in education, in whatever. Because you know, now you're not using Joe's opinion on Reddit to give uh, medical advice. And now you're using you know, scientific papers you know, from JAMA or whatever. So that's, we're going to get back to this in a second. In the interest of time, perhaps. I was just wondering if there, um, if there is any ongoing movement towards um, allowing for like, lane and entry entities to dictate what source you get pulled from. That's something I'm also looking for in my reason. Like, hey, I don't want you to pull from anything, but yeah, that's becoming that's becoming extremely easy to do. But there's a company called Elicit that allows you to, you know, just load up. Uh, I don't know, hundreds of papers that you want, and it will right. retrieve all augmented generation. You train the system on your papers and favor your papers rather than everything else. So, when I talk about the engineering aspect, this is the sort of thing that's happening. It's making things available for even a lay person pretty soon. Not quite that level in most cases, but in your example, yes. But what we're discussing with Devon. Might as well jump into it as a quick comment to talk about modernized knowledge. Is that uh, part of the modernizing the knowledge is to come up? Oh, come on. It is to come up with um, teaching codes in a completely different way. So, really, I, I was telling him I would love to see. Perhaps this is something MCC could offer a full-stack developer that has been trained on AI techniques, but as a systems integrator. Take these routines from GitHub, assemble them, and give me the result. I don't want you to create the code from scratch. So it's adding scripts, not doing the whole design of the code. And that kind of assembly job has enormous market potential, in my opinion. Because that's the engineering phase, where you say, okay, well, um, you know, add me this API to the system or connect me to, to that data set or whatever. Huge demand. Okay. So, the demo is in the details, right? So, when you look at this, and you know, this is one of my easy slides to scale people, when you put the Bloom's taxonomy and you put up the various logos, oh my god, we're doomed. Right? And if you do the same and you say, okay, Albert, luckily we have the um, we have the active domain. We're not totally lost. Well, yeah, okay, we can do the same and with the exception of internalizing emotion, you can say, Oh my god, you can chase us there too. Don't do you just have to go to me. And I think that was lost a long time ago. We had trucks, we had trains, we had all sorts of things that Dwarf us, do a lot faster, better, heavier loads than us. Okay, so what's the what's the refuge? There's no refuge. It's the wrong way of thinking about it. Okay, uh, the same way we are not saying, "Oh, what's the refuge from a train or a giant truck?" Oh, we drive a giant truck. That's the quote unquote refuge. Just not that it step on your foot. That's why you have to pay the fees. So, you know, AI can beat human that transfer. It has much greater range of data than any one of us can have. And so it's going to see analogies that we cannot see. Sometimes they will be wrong. I will always to figure out when it's wrong. On the affected domain, um, okay, how many of you have watched the British, actually formerly Swedish series called Humans? A few. So, you remember in the first season, which is the only season worth watching, because after that it becomes your bad robots, kill human, right? <laughs> <laughs> all of that. It degenerates that way. But in the first season, you had a little five-year-old girl who loved the humanoid robot because the robot was timeless and patient 
And so mommy and daddy were coming home tired and the little girl wanted to see her favorite book read for the 5,000th time, which is something we have all experienced as parents. And, you know, the robot is patient. The robot doesn't get tired or angry or whatever. And so it's tired, less. So it can beat us even in some of these affected domains. And it's fearless. Let me tell you how, for example, it won at Go. When it won at Go, it won for a reason related to human fear, not just computation intensity. How many of you play Go? Okay. What's the question? How many of you play Go? Is any is any even uh, uh, play to chess? For those of you who are not familiar with it, okay. so, uh, it's a chess, but never mind. Go. Okay. So in Go, you win by having more real estate of tokens than your opponent. The problem is, as a human, you don't want to play it too close to the edge, so you're going to try to win by having as much real estate as possible. But imagine for a second that you're an AI and you can compute 50, 60 moves ahead and you can compute the probability of winning by half a square. You do it. The human will be like, I cannot play that close to the edge. The AI does it. So move 37 in the fateful match between the world champion, the Korean world champion, and his mind. The AI put this token somewhere completely implausible for a human. No one could understand why. It became apparent later that it was he knew it was going to win by just half a square. So it's quote unquote brilliant, but it's brilliant because it's not afraid. We as humans uh, frailties and we're afraid. Same exercise with a fighter pilot against an AI. What does the AI do? It plunges against the fighter pilot. It doesn't try to take evasive action and you know, do, do the top gun stuff that you've seen. It's just going to shoot first by plunging against it. No pilot, no human pilot would even think that way. So different behaviors come out of the fact that they're tireless and fearless. It's really interesting to, to see how we can ever do that. But again, the devil is always in the details. You know, Foxconn said, 10 years ago now, that they were going to replace a million workers in China assembling iPhones with robots. <laughs> so easy. <laughs> Everyone said, oh, the self-driving cars are going to drive. And say, not as long as they show me driving at rush hour in the Place de l'Etoile in Paris. Do that, <laughs> and I'll trust you. You're driving across Kansas directed uh, you know, even a Tesla. So, example of detail we have to go through. When we talk about something like creativity or whatever it is we do talk about, we have to go through the detail. It's not enough just to look at the words, but you have to look at the definition behind the words. And that's what we spend a lot of time doing at the center, you know, thinking through what exactly we mean by creativity or critical thinking or, or, or curiosity, etc. So that we knew then how to compare these various parameters with what AI can do now, can do in the future, and whether it can be complementary. That's the level of rigor and analysis that we go through to say yes or no. It's not otherwise you say, oh my god, it's going to replace us because it can be more creative than us. Or worse, say, oh no, humans are so creative. There's no AI that can ever mimic us. False. False. 10% of, I mean, half percent actually of creativity is radical creativity. The rest is incremental. Meaning, it's creativity by analogy and by extrapolation. I would bet you that an AI can do, no, I don't have to bet you. You know that an AI can do extrapolation and analogy very, very, very easily because it's trained on exactly that, on doing exactly that. It just looks at the statistical inferences and says, oh, two blades, three blades, four blades, hmm, five blades perhaps? Right? Uh, that's what happens with Jeanette. Right. One, two, three, four, five blades doesn't require much imagination. But imagination is what's required if you want to differentiate yourself. So when you look at something like creativity, you have to figure out what do I emphasize? Which facet of creativity do I emphasize? 
taking a little bit of a step back, we've, we've seen this race before, right? With the Industrial Revolution, with the Digital Revolution, we invented mass schooling, so now we have to mass sophisticate our education. And so we have to rethink the what, we have to rethink the how. That's what we are having to do. And for the rest of this conversation, there are plenty of AI and education capabilities. I'm only going to talk about the adaptive systems and personalization and sound development tutoring systems. I'm not going to go through the administrative capabilities and all that. It's just too much. But what we end up really is the sort of really, very naive question. So I ask it to you why learn any knowledge when search engines know everything? What's right or wrong about this assertion? Search engines will make errors. Yeah. Yeah? You have to know enough to even know what you want to search for. Right. The, the question I have, I've been thinking here, is, and I'm not sure I'm formulating it the right way, is what's, what's the credibility of the data that's being presented? I mean, sure. you know, and if you look at peer review articles, they're cited because they're referencing other articles that have been um, agreed upon. It's all by agreement. I, I understand that. But like, what is the what is the validity or credibility of what you're getting AI? I mean, you know, I'm just, I'm just doing a proposal, and I asked AI to write the opening statement to my proposal, and it sounded really good. I mean, I, you know, my husband says it didn't sound like well, it didn't sound authentic to him. It didn't sound like me. You know, and they said things to me. So I'm just wondering. Uh, what you know? What's the validity or cred the credibility of using AI? I mean, it's just it's sort of like a guy in the diner conversation about what's going on, rather than based in any. I'm not. I'm just asking a question. I'm just really okay, so that's a different. You're asking a question, where I'm asking you to answer this question. So okay. So I'll answer it because it's on your mind, so I can free up your mind to <laughs> listen to the rest. Otherwise, you'll be stuck on it if you like. Uh, so, look, um, first of all, yes, not only is it going to write it for you in a whole long sort of way, but it's also going to give you fake references that don't exist. I've had, you know, something spit out 15 references with names of the research that I recognize, and then I will look for that and actually when they never wrote this, is the AI confabulated. As a researcher, you also know that you can game it by citing the researchers that you like and that have said the things that respond to what you want. Just say, right? We, we know the research world too. So the point is, it requires a lot of critical thinking to figure out how to do it right, and it requires you to know how these things work well or not to know how to improve on them, right? So use the tool, but have an enormously critical mind. So to use... Um, use nuclear uh, power terminology, trust but verify, right? Hang the trust and super verify. Yeah. Okay, back to the question, you can answer it. Um, you, you have to have knowledge to recognize what's valuable and what's not valuable, you know, like you say, you use the crap from the boat. Um, yeah. So, yeah. if you don't, if you receive information, if you don't have the ability to distinguish and determine that's the information. Totally agree. But I'm waiting for one person to say that the question makes no sense at all to begin with. Don't even ask the question, Charles, because... Oh, no, you were about to say it. I know it. I knew it. That's okay. Don't bother. Congratulations. You did it. So the point is, these questions make no sense because Google knows nothing. Absolutely nothing. It even knows about things. It knows nothing. And that's an example yet of you know human terminology that we use that completely confuses people. And this is something you know you hear even in, in high circles. Somebody knows no, that's not nothing. And so, same question. Why should we do it? If AI can do it, first of all, we just said it cannot do everything. So again, stupid question. Right. So why learn how to calculate? How learn how to read? How learn how to think? Come on. Don't you want to have a society or, or what? Yeah, are you going to waste, you know, are you going to leave your kids at home with a VR headset playing games all their youth and then suddenly by age 20, aha, now I'm ready to use AI. What was the question again? 
you need to scaffold and to learn. You need to shape that brain. But to shape that brain, you need to embrace versatility. It's not just about, you know, the traditional discipline. It's about all sorts of new things you should be learning. Everybody should be exposed to social sciences, to entrepreneurship, to uh, engineering, yes, and technology. So the traditional canon that we have is really insufficient. Of course, that's a message for K-12, but you also have a role to play in this versatility. And we, that also means that we need both breadth and depth, and we need to build more depth with different areas of knowledge. Because we've given you the Swiss Army knife, you can now repurpose things to sharpen a different blade throughout your life. Right? We've given her a strong case, and I can do more. And the problem is, it, it stalls for polymath, but when we think about polymath, we think about, you know, amazing people, and it, we forget that we're all polymathic. We all have more than one capability. We're not insects. I mean, even insects have more than one capability, but you see what I mean. I mean, we, we don't have to be a Da Vinci or a Hypatia or whatever to do this sort of thing. Okay, so that means that we develop knowledge, skills, character, meta learning. You've seen this before. And we'll talk quickly about some other knowledge before I let you ask questions. So, knowledge. Of course, people say, even said with search, oh my god, this is the end of declarative knowledge. We don't need to know facts anymore. Okay, so if I don't know any fact, every time you're going to say a word, or something, oh, let me look it up. Extremely efficient. And of course, that hasn't built my cognitive capabilities. So, what exactly am I functioning out of? Nothing? False. Okay, so you need declarative knowledge. You just have to make better choices about what type of declarative knowledge you need, not whether or not you need declarative knowledge. Again, devil in the detail. Procedural knowledge, sure you do it. You do need it. But it would be a lot better if you understood the concepts behind the procedure. So here's my favorite example. Exponential. Since we were talking about Moore's law, exponential. One feature of exponentials is never taught in math school, in math courses. And that feature is not just the content. Everybody can come up with an exponential formulation. That's the easy part. What's the core concept behind it? Tick tock, tick tock. Take a look at them. Politicians dilly dally because they don't know the core concept behind the exponential. And like someone in my family said, hey, we only have 18 cases in this country. This week, what's the big deal? Well, because I've lived with exponential words in microchips, I know that next week it's going to be 180, the following week is going to be 1800, the following weekend is going to be 18,000, and the airport will be closed. So, good person, come home. Now, um, that's because politicians don't understand, and they were never taught in math class, three words deceiving, then explosive. Deceiving, then explosive. Imagine for a second if everybody who's taken exponentials in, in school remembered those three words. We would have saved ourselves trillions of dollars during the pandemic. And untold trillions to come with global warming. Deceiving, and it explodes on you. By the time it explodes on you, it requires a lot more energy and effort to hold it back in than when you do feed forward rather than feed back. Okay, skills, character, and everybody. Questions at this point? I'm sorry we're starting to run late. I'm just enjoying myself too much. So, so this is how I get my car. What's, you know, what's our latitude to... Uh, we have another uh, about 10, uh, 10 minutes, so I will have to shut it down. <laughs> Hi, you might be going here in a few minutes, but I'm thinking about the ethical parts of all of this. We're facing a lot of students who don't want to do deep learning 
and we're a society of media gratification. So, Siri, tell me about this, uh, and what, what is the answer to this? We're seeing students do homework like this, and therefore we're getting college students without a lot of understanding on how to learn deeply. And so there's that other side. I'm not anti-AI, but I'm concerned about the lack of work. They don't want to read books. They don't want to know deeply. So remember the comment I made on the other side of, of here uh, saying lazy by good evolutionary design. Lazy by good evolutionary design. They are lazy by good evolutionary design. If they can put their minds on auto, autopilot and deliver you with the right paper, they're going to do that. Your job is changing now. Your job is to make time. Ask whatever Siri you call down now, or you want. Know chat GPT or whatever you want, now you better justify the answer. And I'm gonna rate you on justifying the answer. It means that you really understand or you don't. First of all, I wanna see how you ask the questions. What kind of prompts did you write? What kind of intelligence you put into your research to even ask the right question? Why was this the right question? Right? And then on the other side of it, okay, tell me how you interpret this. Now the students stop, right? So you just change your strategy. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Just, just stay what's there. Because again, you know, it's fair game to be quote unquote lazy by good evolutionary design. You know, I would do it if I had a guaranteed A just by asking ChatGPT why not. So the point is, if you're going to make me think, force me to think. Assessment. Okay, so before we completely run out of time, 21st century skills for financial education, you know all this stuff already. I was here, you remember everything. Um, no restrictions offer pedagogy, no assessment code wide, and largely free, they will be crazy. So we're now offering professional development, and we're developing an assessment tool. Because we want to be able to look at all of these competencies in a, with an eye of AI and see what can we measure and how do we measure it properly. We want to pay attention to various uh, emphases that we want to add, as I described it earlier, imagination, not just the code we adopt, but specifically more imagination. So again, for instance, for your paper, Jim, uh, okay, if you were to ask the student, well, imagine something that's unusual, and you do the same search, and you give me your search parameters before, right? You say you're gonna have to show me that you have the exact question that you have given me, I wanna see the result, and I'm gonna see how you've improved on the result. But you are gonna go to the same engine, say we're all gonna use ChatGPT, go to the same engine, you ask the same question, you know exactly what it's gonna say, more or less, because it changes its mind depending on the time of the day. It does. Um, and then you compare to what the student has given you and see how more, how different it is, how more imaginative it is. So we have a few tools, you know, just stay ahead, one step ahead. Lastly, personalization. So you're familiar with the four dimensions, but what we've added to the model is this issue of motivation. And again, it's to answer questions like yours about, well, okay, but they're gonna go for the simplest possible answer they can find. And the point here is, okay, well, what on their motivation? Extrinsic, meaning you're not getting the grade unless you, that's extrinsic. And intrinsic, meaning how can I get you interested in actually putting in the effort? How does this match with something of interest to you? And for that, I'm gonna look at your identity and belonging, your agency and growth mindset, your sense of purpose and your passions, and try to say, okay, fine, use whatever you want, but I, I uh, challenge you to use it for something you actually care about and justify it. So we're gonna talk about this a little bit more in a second. But the point being, this, if you're looking for areas where AI cannot go or cannot go easily anytime soon, it's these areas of agency and purpose. 
we control that. We control what the AI does. And they don't have a purpose in particular except answering statistically what you ask. That's their purpose. They don't even know that they have that purpose. They're not self-aware. So um, we are the active ones, and we need to keep it this way. So I'm going to skip over these things. Of course, for the student's motivation, you have to do more than just what they love. It's what they're good at, what they can be paid for, and what the world needs. And we're going to want to push them towards what the world needs in terms of purpose. So, OK, fine. Um, let's say we all design a robot. Your robot is going to be a flying one. Mine is going to be a swimming robot. Justification. Why? And then the person with the flying robot will say, OK, because I want the flying robot to detect mine or help crops or whatever. OK, that's, that's worthy. That's purpose worthy. And I'm going to say, because I want to count plastic particles in the ocean. OK, we have a purpose here. So you see how you can push the students to be intrinsically motivated, yet forcing them to do the sort of work that you have to have them done. OK, we know why projects are important. Let's skip over this. Okay. So OK, so we're learning with the machine. Right, and this is how in 1899, Jean-Marc Cotet viewed year 2000. <laughs> That's different. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, there are a few metaphors involved. The grinding the books. Uh, you know, at the time, mechanical engineering was the big thing, right? So that was the high tech of the late, the late 1800s. So it was mechanically engineering driven. Right, and electricity had just started, so you could just <laughs> between between electroshock <laughs> therapy and grinding books, we're almost there. <laughs> um, but what we really can do now is these feedback loops where we design an engine that helps you with lesson plan design and curriculum design, and we can tie it to another engine that's gonna be taking the feedback from the students and measuring how well they're doing about these competencies. This is something we're actually working on both sides of this. And the, the professor-teacher side is this uh, engine we call SAGE, on um, AI, of course, um, and helps you shrink the amount of time you spend on design and spend a lot more time on delivery and tailor the delivery to the student body that you have. And this is what Sage looks like, very unimpressive. Check the chat box, right? So, but the good news about it is that it's trained on 138,000 peer reviewed papers. So it's not Joe's opinion from Reddit, it's Jane's opinion from the journal or whatever. Hopefully, that's hallucinatory. And one of the big things we all going to have to figure out is the range of possibilities, right? From 100% teacher-driven to 100% student intelligent tutored, intelligently tutored, and everything in between. What is what are the ratios needed by which discipline? Because some disciplines being more vertical, like math, might be easier to go in an ITS direction, intelligent tutor system direction, than than disciplines that are more horizontal, like. Uh, social sciences or social studies or languages. And adaptiveness is going to matter because it allows you to self pace so the student can catch up. It allows you to reduce the learning time in general. And eventually, it may help with the two sigma tutoring problem. Right? Because you know, those two sigma problem, where if you have a teacher, you do two sigma better than if you don't have it. Also, what is going to be the right ratio between that intelligent electronic tutor and you as a human tutor, all of you triangulating on that AI. So it used to be a one-on-one -on -one relationship, teacher-student, and now it's going to be one, two, three with the AI as well. So I think that's it. There's plenty of more details in this book that you spend a lot of time on. So if there's any interest here, I think you have mentioned something. I, I, I think I have this idea of being very quick. Actually, I'll be showing that book to everyone uh, in a moment. And, and uh, when people know that they want a copy of it, all you need to do is contact me. Um, okay, I'll finish just in time. Well, I, 
I, I certainly want to say thank Charles, um, who's um, president of Lightning, um, talk about AI. I've been studying AI for years, so whenever I hear Charles speak, I always learn something new, which is what we want to learn. Um, and I, I particularly appreciate the fact that Charles has emphasized the point that Companies with AI is not, is not so it's an ongoing conversation for all fields, particularly for education, but that this has been a very good contribution to that conversation, um, which we're going to continue out to today. Certainly, next up with um, a panel of um, faculty and staff who will be talking to us about how they've used AI um, in their work. And of course, later today during session one, there will be a session in um, the uh, PLC Innovation Room with Sogo. Where faculty and students will be talking about AI. I just want to make sure that you know that there are AI permeated discussions throughout the day. Peter, can I make one comment? Sure. So, for those of you who are still wondering, should I use it or should I not? Okay. Let's be serious. Um, imagine for a moment that you were one of those cave men, women, and someone came up with the video. And you're like, oh, you know, this new technology too much into it. So fine, someone who is into that technology is gonna go far farther distances, carry heavier loads, and go faster. So you can decide not to use the wheel. Go on for it, good luck to you. But someone using the wheel is gonna punch you. Oh, that word. Okay, never mind. <laughs> it's gonna go significantly beyond you. Um, and so that's really your choice. You want to be left behind, or you want to really drive the car? So, you know, it's not that you have a choice, honestly. Uh, you just have to do it, but you have to do it intelligently, not be afraid of it, but also not overexpect it. And that's why you guys are really lucky to have Devin here. I mean, it's lucky that you have him. I really mean it, because he can help guide you about what's real, what's unreal. Sorry, your email boss can explode now. All right, thanks all. Take care. I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to miss you. Our next up, uh, next uh, minute to go, will be a series of um, panelists who I um, uh, recruited my um, faculty and staff who will talk about their experiences with using AI. So we're going to go from the motion vision that Charles presented to more localized vision here. In this so there'll be a transition moment, so I do need to get some stretch. I finally need to do so um, as I arrange to get out some kind of the um, 